memory. I have I.O. devices. I may have a couple of different chips. I've got modem stacks and applications and all kinds of user frameworks and all that stuff is good. And we're learning how to apply tools to look at a lot of these things. I can look at a static analysis tool to analyze an application and say, is there buffer overruns in it or misuse of data or tag information as I'm processing it through. I may have people that are looking at the operating system trying to figure out how to do robustness functions so that I have isolation and virtual machines. I may be looking at user environments uh, and frameworks that allow me to put applications into those kind of spaces. But very often what I'm not seeing is what's going on in the middle of all these components. That's where the security problems all lie. As an example, about two years ago, there was a paper, a series of papers actually published, I believe it was at the RSA conference, where someone took a system and they were running AES with a strong key. They didn't try to break the AES. They didn't try to break the key. What they did is go down at the processor level, look at the caches in the system, identify where tables for uh, the algorithm were being loaded, and then use the timing through that part of the system to actually extract the keys. They were looking at those individual cracks, the boundary conditions between the functions. AES was not broken. AES is a strong algorithm. The keys were sufficiently long. The application was written reasonably well. But they didn't take it into account the fact that they had to look at all of the components on the system at the same time to be able to do that. One of the concerns that I had, in fact, we had this discussion at lunch today, is that one of the problems that I'm seeing in our education system, especially in software people, we're training them to look at things like abstraction. Look at how do you build very large, robust software systems, and appropriately so. But the problem is when I take a software person and start to talk to them about doing security components and, and analysis, they don't know what's going down underneath that abstraction. Very often, they don't even know what's going on in the operating system, let alone down in the hardware. So if I go to a software person and say, what's happening with this information stream? What registers is it going through on the processor? What buses is it touching? I very often get a very blank stare. They don't know. My problem is I'm seeing a lot of older people like myself that have been around for a lot of years in this industry. We had to build hardware. We had to write software. We had to look at things like register components. Probably aren't too many people in the room that's ever taken a, a very small, small processor function, used a hex keypad, and actually typed all your code in that way. Some of us that grew up in, when we went to universities and, and took training classes, that's what we did. We had a very good understanding of that. The problem is, is I don't see the hardware people and the software people really looking at those kind of interactions today in a way that I think the security uh, organizational functions really need to take place. As an example, we had a product team uh, come to us uh, uh, recently, about two years ago, and I can't describe exactly which product is, but I think you'll get the gist of the, of the concept. What they did is they had purchased a, a platform or a, a set of hardware and software uh, stacks from a, a third-party vendor and put it into a system. The system was essentially uh, designed to take voice communication between point A and point B. The problem that they uh, encountered is they identified the fact that there was a software bug on that third-party stack uh, on the processor. The result of that particular software bug said 10 months or so, give or take a couple of weeks, after that particular device was deployed, that bug would get uh, hit and it would die. It would no longer turn on, rather catastrophically. So the problem is they had millions of these devices in the field and all of a sudden they're looking at their calendar saying they had this ramp up of sales and installations and that was really good. They realized that 10 months later they were going to have this massive ramp up of failures and every device that was out there was going to come back in. So they came into my organization and said, we don't have any way to fix this other than a massive recall, bring every product back in, it's going to be very expensive. Your team understands things like viruses and trojans and so on. Is there any way you can write a virus to go into our product and make this change? It was a very interesting problem. They said, oh, by the way, you only have six weeks to figure it out. <laughs> my team started. We looked at it. We said, the first place we're going to start all those gray areas, what's happening on the system. We looked at the in inputs, we looked at the protocols, the network interfaces. We said it's primarily a voice traffic. Oh, somebody put in a little piece of code that allowed essentially a modem function to do digital commands to the device. Interesting, what can you do with it? What happens if I send a mail form command down that interface? I tell it I'm going to send it a data packet. It's going to have 100 bytes and I send 200 bytes. What happens? Well, the immediate response from the product group is, you can't do that. And I said, I didn't ask if I could do that. I said, what happens if I do do that? You can't do that. Why not? You can't get certified. I said, I'm a virus writer. I don't care if I get certified. Neither do the attackers. That's the space they're going to start. So we started looking at that function. We said, 
yeah, if you put a particular message down this pipe, tell it's got 100 bytes and send 200 bytes, it walks from the stack over into the next application. Very interesting. What can I do from that application? Turned out from that application, I could exploit a problem in the operating system and actually open a channel to another processor. Oh, cool, what can I do with that? So I pushed some data through that channel to the other processor, found an application that I could touch over there, put my data up in that area, then what could I do? Well, it turns out that guy could make a call back to the first processor and actually invoke some software routines to update Flash. Now, that's a short version of what we did in about six months. So I was able to take this particular system, I was able to play a file, update their software. So if you happen to have one of these devices, you can answer the device and say, I'm in a voice call, and all of a sudden you hear a little noise because I'm playing a WAV file in the background. Your system would stop for a few minutes and reboot. When it came up, it had different software, and guess what? It wouldn't fail after 10 months. We looked at all of that space around that, uh, each one of those interfaces, and the problem was is the product organization that was involved in that particular product said, it can't be done. Why? Because they very tightly controlled what happened in the application. They tightly controlled what happened in the stack. They tightly controlled what happened in the operating system. And not a single one of them ever looked in the spaces in the middle. And that's where we have to go. That's why I really believe it's critical within our training programs, we are looking at this ability to train people that are thinking about careers in the security space. Think about the gray space. Whether that gray space is between applications, and between layers within a, a small system, or whether you're dealing with it in a massive uh, overriding network, it doesn't make any difference. That's where the problems are going to be. We've learned how to put things like algorithms and encrypt, encryption functions and MAC layers within our capabilities. Now we need to start looking at those cracks. Next thing I want to do is, is answer this question, why is why bad? One of the things that I often talk about with my product groups, and it usually gets me in trouble, is I say, if you're asking the question why, you've probably already lost. And they don't like that. The reason why I think that's an important thing that we have to be very cautious about catching is because it brings down the, uh, the fundamental issue of what is it that I'm concerned about within my product. If I'm doing security functions, I'm going to be doing a couple of things. First, I want to define my assets. What's important to me and what's it going to be that somebody else might be interested in? I'm going to establish the threat model. How is it that they can get into my system and what can they do when they get there? I want to evaluate all those boundaries and gray spaces that I was talking about earlier. The next thing I want to do is start to develop a cost model. What is it going to cost me or my customers if I lose or have my assets compromised? What is it going to cost me to protect it if I'm not doing enough protection on the device? And the third thing we have to look at is what is the cost for someone to uh, attack my system and get at those assets? So these three cost functions begin to form the analysis points for uh, risk analysis. For the last number of years, probably the last seven or eight years, I've drawn a chart that essentially uh, shows a, a block that says, here's the amount of functions that I can lose, here's what uh, is going to cost me to protect it, and here's what's going to cost me or cost an attacker to come at me, and when do I get in balance is what I want to do within a product function. So, for instance, if I have an asset that's worth $100 and it costs my adversary $200 to get at it, they may be able to physically get at it, but I'm not going to see a lot of loss that way. People are not going to typically spend several hundred dollars to get at $100. But if I have an asset that's worth $100 and they can spend $2 and get at it, I guarantee it's going to be lost in a whole lot of time. So then I have to look at what it's going to cost me to protect it. If it's going to cost me another $100 to protect it, I have to be very careful from a product standpoint that maybe I just need to change my business model because the risk may not be worth it. I'm going to do this analysis, this trade-off between these various cost models, and then generally I'm going to have to establish a roadmap for the evolution or the revolution in my protection functions. What's going to happen over time is our products are going to increase the value. My assets are going to definitely increase. Every year we come out with new things, new capabilities, new services, and every one of those are bringing value to the product. That's their purpose. So the value is going up every year. Now my adversaries are getting better, faster, cheaper tools, so their capabilities, they're coming up, and their, their cost to attack is going down. So if my value is going up and their cost to, to attack is going down, that means I've got this bigger and bigger gap, which means every year I've got to do something new, different, and unique. So it's going to be an, an ongoing process. Now, you'll notice that no place in here did I ever ask the question, now, why is somebody going to attack my system? So typically, when I'm dealing with a product person, they want to focus on why is somebody ever going to attack my system, they're not thinking about these issues. What is it that I can lose, and how much is it going to cost me, and how much is it going to cost somebody to come in? 
I am concerned about how much the cost is and what that balance is. I don't 